what have been your impressions even of, of last night so far, beginning your HMT experience? I don't want to leave this country without hearing from Pastor Jocelyn. So can you share your experience last night? <laughs> yeah, what is, what is experiences of last night already here? Because this is his second time here, I think. Have uh, learned a lot. On est dans, dans la and in general, we are so much in, in the theory, like we stay in, inside of the theory. Entend, and when we listen, conseils, and we hear about his experience and his advice, he speaks much more about actions. If, and for me, it's very uh, a great pleasure to be before him and in his presence because he kind of pushes me into the, the mission that God has called me for uh, through his counsel and his advice and teachings. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else, your impressions of last night, maybe already or, or yesterday, what's really... You know, what did you wake up feeling this morning, so far? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Let's get the mic to you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Though we came late yesterday, was to the little I uh, grabs from the people on the field. I hate what I've been doing for three years. Mm. I now know between doing what God asks you to do, what ministry is all about. Wow. You know, the approach, the way we approach ministry, yes. is not the way we, it ought to be. Wow. Because we depend on the traditional way. When you come to church on Wednesday, opening prayer, you need the word, the offering, the tithe, <laughs> go. On Friday, prayer. Yeah. <laughs> on so, uh, deliverance. Deliverance. On Sunday, <laughs> you are going on uh, evangelism. You go with your, with your tract. <laughs> I tell you, in Ireland, if you give tract to people and they drop it on the on the street mm. and they see your the address of your church, mm. the council will send. They will find you. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the council. <laughs> We are uh, littering the, uh, the street. <laughs> now, you, you know, with the concept, with the, you know, the, what, the way they are doing it here, you realize that, you know, and in Africa, we realize that we waste a lot of money. You know, B-board, giant B-board, cost millions. Flyers, costing millions. And so we give it to some people. We put it to the bill. You know, the, the, the face is rich. With flyers. <laughs> that is our approach. There's nothing like touching the lives of people. Yeah. The prisoner that, you know, yeah. you know, the one that we spend on flyers. You know, if we, maybe, you know, what, you know, some, uh, the prisoner in Nigeria, maybe the budget, the have more government, budget for them. The army will cry. Mm. If, I mean, the money they are wasting, if somebody can, you know, where, Tell government that let me just like to invite them. That's Agodi. They can feel Agodi without something. And the result will be when they matter. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. My concept has changed. One more person. <clears throat> Maybe. What you're waking up feeling already so far in this trip. 
I was surprised now more people are sharing. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, after the experiences last night, I woke up. I woke up feeling. Yeah, stand up. Oh. I woke up feeling really excited just because, because I, because I know I'm gonna learn a lot. So just like learning from everyone here, you you just take in all the information, you just think about it. I'm excited on what's gonna happen further in the week. Amen. Where are you from? Uh, California. Yeah, I heard an American accent. Yeah. <laughs> but you're not connected with these Californians. No. We just so it's California's time in Jesus' name. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> it's time for California. <laughs> well, uh, my own story, I'm a uh, fourth generation Pentecostal pastor. Uh, or maybe I could say I used to be Pentecostal. I'm more kingdom now. <laughs> uh, I've received my freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, I was pastoring a youth and young adult revival for about seven years in Toronto, Canada, and I had felt like I hit a ceiling in ministry. Uh, I had a number of frustrations, and I wondered, you know, it felt like I had woken up, you know, the quote, I woke up from a dream to discover everyone else was still sleeping. <laughs> this is how I felt in my country. That, and I thought, I can't even imagine. I've only been pastoring for seven or eight years, I can't imagine pastoring for 30 or 40 years this way. I already thought it's better for me to quit than just doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results and not having results. A few of the main challenges that I was facing at the time was, although we were having great services, uh, you know, we saw people physically healed of some pretty serious things. I couldn't seem to get what was happening in the building out there. I mean, I called the newspaper. I invited them to come. They never came. The police came and labeled us a cult. And because uh, of the wild things we were having going on in the building, as you know. And uh, my other frustration was, as great as our services were, I wasn't seeing the influx of souls being saved that I felt was comparable to the book of Acts. And my mindset was, if I were to grid or grade my results according to the Great Commission, not according to churchianity or I have this many people or, you know, I had at the time the largest young adult ministry in the country. I thought if I were to evaluate my results compared to the Great Commission, I found myself lacking. Really. So I thought if the Great Commission is to disciple nations and the city doesn't even know, we're, we're another church on, on the corner. This became my frustration. When I began to embrace the message of the kingdom, you know, around 2008, uh, you know, the prophets were all saying God is shaking everything that can be shaken, and there's a lot that has happened since 2008. Church has definitely, we've entered into a shift for sure. Um, I felt like I wanted to start social programs. I wanted to motivate people to go beyond the four walls. But the people I chose who I felt would be the strong leaders to do it all quit within a year. <laughs> We had created, you know, single mother program. I created this program and this program, and I, I would sit with them, and I'd been preaching on the kingdom, and I put this in their hands, and I was so excited, and they were so ready to do it. And in time, it was one of a few issues. Either they didn't make the money they wanted to make, North American problems, <laughs> or the warfare was too great, and they began to have attacks in their family that caused them to quit. Or Monday night was soccer, Tuesday night gymnastics, Wednesday night youth group, Thursday night skating, Friday night family night, Saturday. There, there was no uh, time. Really what they were saying was, I don't have time to reach people. 
I don't have time to lay my life down for the sake of societal transformation. And then, of course, you have some who say, God is calling me just to sit. <laughs> God is calling me to rest and just sit in church. And I would say, well, are you in sin? You know, is everything okay? No, 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 God is just transitioning us and we don't know where. And I said, but two weeks ago you said God was calling you to this ministry. And these were the challenges I was facing. And I remember sitting in my office and I had like, I literally was sitting like this and I thought, these are some of the best leaders that I have. If this is the best we can do, no wonder the church is not transforming the world. That was the conclusion I came to. And God had mercy on me. Uh, one night as I was praying, I went to, to bed, and around conservative people, I call it a dream. But around you guys, I'll tell you the truth. I had what was, you know, by me, I consider an out-of-body experience. I never had one before that, and I've never had one since. But it was a real Book of Acts experience, and I was... I just laid down, as soon as my head hit the pillow, I was in this like, you know, dreamlike state, and I was in Ukraine. I had been coming to Ukraine for years, but this was just so different. I could smell the smells, I could see the signs that I couldn't read or understand. And I knew I was in the streets, and then suddenly, I was in this room right here, although I had never seen this room as yet. And there were chairs all in a circle the way Pastor Sunday normally has them at the start of the HMT. And I'm, I'm seeing all of this. And in this dreamlike state, I'm seeing leaders from around the world gathered. And Pastor Sunday is walking around laying hands on them. And we're all praying in tongues. Uh, and keep in mind, you know, I was very Pentecostal still at the time. <laughs> and he, he lays his hands on me. He prays, and when he goes to walk away, I yell out and reach to grab him, and I say, I want more! That was just, it was like every fiber of my being was screaming that, you know, I was just so desperate for something more than what I was experiencing. And instead of Pastor Sunday returning and laying hands on me again, he stepped back, and he said, if you want more, and then he named three things. These three things that he named, you're, you're going to try to write them down, but I'm not going to share them with you. Because uh, <laughs> you're, you're going to learn them. If I shared them with you now, you, you might think it's strange. Yeah. Uh, these three things really broke my box as far as how to have more of God. Because it had nothing to do with a church service. It had everything to do with transforming your mentality. It had nothing to do with binding Satan. It had everything to do with dealing with mindsets, flesh, disciplines, all of these things that I really couldn't grasp at that time until I came and had the <coughs> HMT experience. So when I, when I came out of this state, I uh, called Pastor Sunday. And to my shock, he said, you won't believe it. I'm holding an intensive training at my house right now. And the three things I told you in this dream are the three themes I'm teaching on. And it's to Russian people, so you couldn't possibly have known. He said, this has been your Macedonian experience. You need to come to Ukraine and uh, experience these new trainings that I'm doing. So I raised some money and packed my bags to come again. And uh, before I left, a friend of mine from UK had already been here. And I called him. I said, what's the deal with this? boot camp thing, you know, and my, my paradigm was still great services, revival, you know, all of this, and which are good, and uh, he said, Derek, you don't, I don't know if you want to go, it is so intensive, it, it is like you have homework assignments, you have to get things done at a certain time, if you don't, you get a red dot, if you get three red dots, you have to change your ticket and fly home, <laughs> and you have two workshops in the morning, and then a wor uh, to workshops in the afternoon and then you got to fit in the homework. You have to read three books. You have to read one book each day. 
I was terrified, <laughs> absolutely terrified. I wasn't an academic student. One book a month was, was revival for me. <laughs> that is the truth. I was terrified and I had like regret and I thought, I don't know if I should have done this. <laughs> so I flew here and when I walked into the room, you know, they had renovated all this. And there were the chairs all in a circle. I couldn't believe it. It was exactly what I had seen. So we began the first, uh, the first night, which started at like 9 o'clock, which I couldn't believe. You know, <laughs> Usually we start things at 6 or 7. And it's an hour and a half, and you go home. But we started at 9 o'clock. And when they handed out the homework, I don't know if this training will be as intense as the one that uh, there is Caroline from L.A. She's filming uh, this for the TV show. Let's welcome her. Wave to Caroline. So when they handed out the homework, I could physically feel my face flushing. Like, I was terrified. So we, you know, we were released after the movie Pursuit of Happiness to go begin our homework. And I discovered I was having to share a room with this guy from France really great guy, but he snored so loud. <laughs> and I went to the, I have a point to all this story. I went to the administrator and I said, you know, I paid extra money to have my own room. It was Ludmila. And I'll never forget what she said. She looked at me and she said, oh, pastor, we're not always given the most ideal environment to accomplish our destiny in. <laughs> We're not always given the most uh, comfortable environment. Was that Luda? Luda, to accomplish our destiny in. <laughs> and uh, again, my paradigm was the more comfortable it is, the more godly it must be. You know, <laughs> <laughs> my blessing is coming to me now in the name of Jesus. You know, I had real, real Christianity that way. So I, I get into, I have to share a bed with this guy from France. And uh, he's snoring, and I can't sleep. So I asked them, could you at least bring me a cot to sleep in a separate bed? I don't like sleeping in a bed with anybody. And uh, they brought a cot, and I discovered cots in Ukraine are different than cots in <laughs> North America. So I'm, I'm so uncomfortable. And you know when you're really trying to sleep? Because they had said, you need to get the most sleep the first night. You know when you're really trying to sleep, and you can't, so you start getting anxiety, and... And, uh, you know, one in the morning went by, two in the morning went by, three in the morning went by. And finally, uh, I'm telling you the truth, all, all my stuff inside of me, like I know we're learning systems and all that. You're going to learn systems. But the heart of this, you've got to get the heart of this. Because if I share the results that we're having now around the world, you want to know how we're doing this. Uh, all of my stuff began to come to the surface for me to confront. And it wasn't demons, and it wasn't, you know, an issue with God. It was issues of pride, issues of insecurity, issues of fear. Uh, I got in touch that night with religiosity that I didn't know I had. You know, I wanted to go home, back to my comfortable service, just have church, because this was scary to me. And you don't realize that, and I think it was partially supernatural, because it's not that bad sharing a bed with somebody, but there was something happening to me called a breaking point. And this is also why most of the leaders I had started to work with had quit, was there's a point called the point of no return, where you can bring a person to, and if they cross that threshold or are forced into it by life circumstances through pressure and crisis, if they can cross that point of no return, they'll become a different person and do things they never dreamed of. But because our church culture has been such a comfort-based culture, we have been programmed and conditioned to retract when something begins to feel uncomfortable. This is the truth. And we think it couldn't be God or, you know, it's not meant to be this hard. Whereas in other countries where you see the gospel really working, a lot of the times it's because somebody has paid a price 
and cross that, that point of breaking. And I had heard Pastor Sunday mentioning this breaking point thing and moving at light speed, the realm where God is, where all things are possible, where his strength becomes perfected in your weakness. I never understood that great exchange. We have a lot of ministries today that function according to their ability, and we ask God to bless it. But if you can become weak and begin to access his strength, and I didn't realize the History Makers intensive training environment is designed to break you, it's designed to weaken you, it's designed to bring you to a place where you can't even finish or do this thing unless you access divine power. When th this is what they were teaching. This is why Pastor Sunday made the shift into the, tr the intensive training environment, was to teach us how to do ministry according to what Paul calls grace and apostleship. To bring about not the obedience of the saints with your business card, the obedience of the Gentiles to transform whole societies. One man, as Pastor Sunday said, cannot do what's been done here in Ukraine unless God is doing it through him. But there's so much of us in the way that God has to sometimes choreograph and orchestrate severe challenges and even crisis in our lives to bring us to a place of weakness before him. And then to remain in that place where it's his strength functioning through us. So that night, as I laid there in that bed, I don't know why, I even had some tears. I said, God, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get three red dots. I can't function without sleep. Um, I'm going to be embarrassed in front of my mentor. I'm going to be sent home. All this came to my mind, and I prayed this prayer. I said, I can't do this. I can't finish this training unless you do this through me. Amen. That was the, and it was from my heart. It wasn't just I surrender all. Mm -hmm. It was like, I can't do this. <laughs> I, this is overwhelming me. And at that moment, I felt the presence of God fill that room. And it wasn't the guy from France. He was just long asleep snoring. I felt the presence of someone walking over to my cot. I'm telling you the truth. And when I felt that, it was like I was afraid to look up that if I saw him, I might die. That's the only way I could uh, translate to you what I was feeling. And as I laid there with tears in my eyes in the presence of the Lord, I heard the voice of God say, you can fall asleep because I'll stay awake for you. Amen. That was what he said. And I didn't quite understand it at the time, but it was a real exchange of, you know, I will take your anxiety and inability to sleep and I will give you my rest. Amen. And I fell asleep immediately. Now, I woke up a couple hours later at 6 because we had to get up and pray and do all these things. But I had an unusual energy, strength. Uh, I could never type well on the keyboard. And I could type at, you know, like light speed. And why not? Jesus can type fast. I couldn't, but he can. In heaven, they type fast. And, and this was as it is in heaven was was flowing through me, and I began to score excellent on every uh, workshop. And I was more, yeah. May I just say, not only excellent, but we've seen his work later. It was supernatural. It was perfect. It's only he and Dr. Vince that had such excellent work from any HMT. So it was really God. Mm. So I, I think God was trying to teach me a principle. And whether it's through the HMT or through your own life circumstances. In, in your weakness, he is strong. Amen. And I want to give you some principles today on uh, understanding national transformation. <coughs> understanding national transformation. So, just to finish this story here, when I went home, I started holding HMTs in our church. And... The most unlikely people, the people I would have never chose, were graduating and starting ministries and they were succeeding in them. Like people I would have never chose, like I mentioned uh, Patrick Flontek. He's got to be in his early 70s now. 
you know, he had body pain, he had sleep difficulty, and he was terrified of taking the training. He took it. He graduated at the top of the class. And he started a program based on the principle. I'm going to talk a lot about principles this morning. Based on the principle of honor your father and your mother, that, uh, you know, there's a blessing on that principle and commandment. So he started a program called Budding with Seniors, which mobilizes young people to meet with seniors who are lonely, who have no one to visit with them, and uh, spend time with them. And he now oversees as well three seniors' churches in three different senior centers. And he, you know, he had sat in church for 20 plus years, never led a single person to the Lord. He now says he's leading people to the Lord almost on a weekly basis, many of them even before they die. So as we were conducting these trainings, we were seeing person after person starting programs and it was working. So over time, we eventually made it a national school and we set up uh, a system that produces lots of projects and I'll talk about that later. And uh, we began to take it to Bulgaria. To, uh, from here today, I fly to Namibia, Africa, to hold more trainings there. We have social councils set up there. We have things happening you know, all over the world now, by God's grace. So I want to give a number of principles this morning on understanding national transformation. The first thing I'd like to say is that great services don't transform countries. Great church services don't transform nations. And you might think you have grasped that now in this environment, but when you fly home, you're not going to be under this open heaven that somebody paid a price for. You're going to fly right back into your city or country that is ruled by various principalities and mindsets. Mm -hmm. And you might go right back to having great services and church as usual. So that's point number one. Just, you could just read it back, you know. Great services don't transform nations. Can I just say this little parentheses that Derek put in there was one of the most important things you'll ever hear in Kiev. Did you catch it? It's Don't true. think that it's when true. you go back home that the revelation you have right now that you're just automatically going to keep having it. Because here we're under an open heaven because of the price Pastor Sunday has paid. So realize that it will easily get lost if you don't take it into you while you're here. Mm -hmm. It's very true. It's very true.